Hey everyone, welcome back to the online ministry of Grace Baptist Church. And throughout the summer, if you've been with us, we've been in a series called How Jacob Became Israel. And Jacob's story gives us hope because he was born in so much dysfunction. <laughs> there were so many problems. And yet God has been changing him step by step by his grace. Now, we all wish that there weren't screens separating us from each other right now. Uh, but if you leave a comment below, we can at least encourage each other that we're not alone. That's especially true if you're new to our ministry. And we want you to feel welcome. And we want you to feel a part of things. Now, many of you have probably heard the term learned helplessness somewhere along the way. It comes from a famous study by Martin Seligman and Steve Meyer. They took three groups of German shepherds. Now, the first group was given an electric shop, shock, but they had this little lever that they could press on to make it stop. The second group had the same shock and the same lever, except the lever didn't work. And the third group didn't receive any shocks. Afterwards, they put each dog in a large container with this low divider in the middle that split the container into two sections. One side of the container gave off an electric shock. The other side didn't. What they discovered was that the dogs in groups one and three learned very quickly to step over the divider to avoid getting shocked. The dogs in group two, however, did nothing to avoid the unpleasant experience. They just sat there and took it. The reason? They had learned through the experience of a broken lever that there was nothing that they could do to overcome their circumstances. And interestingly, demonstrations, warnings, rewards seem to have no effect on these group two dogs. Their past controlled them. Now that seems like an important warning for any of us who are interested in change and personal growth. If we're ever going to break free from our past, we need to confront some of the patterns that bind us. We need to see ourselves in new ways and change what we believe about the world around us. And I think today's passage helps us to do that. It looks at an event in the life of Jacob that he was hoping he could, could avoid. But God uses it to help him mature. And it, it, he uses it to develop him. Now, if you don't have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to pause the video at this point and go get one. It'll help to have it open as I walk through the passage. I'm going to be reading from Genesis chapter 31, verse 26. Before I start reading, to set the scene, Jacob's become convinced it's time to move on. And in fact, God has urged him to move on. He spent 20 years working for his father-in-law, and it's all become too much. But Jacob fears that Laban's reaction is going to be terrible. <laughs> so he and his family steal away secretly. When Laban realizes what's happened, he and his men come chasing after him. In verse 26, we learn what happens when Laban catches up to him. And I'll, I'll read uh, initially up to verse 29. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you have tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre? And why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? Now you have done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. This is the word of God. Now the scene initially reads like a parent catching their teenager sneaking out at night to go to a party. Jacob had tried to run away, but he was caught in the act. In verse 26, Laban asks Jacob, what's going on? He says, you've tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword. Jacob's acting like a kidnapper or a hostage taker, and Laban wants to know why. But his question seems strange and insincere. Surely Laban knows why. He asks again in verse 27, Why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me? But everyone knows the answer. While Laban suggests that if 
only he'd have known, he would have planned this huge going away party with dancing and singing and a hired band. We know that he's not telling the truth. Laban had become more and more frustrated with Jacob's riches, and his sons are convinced that Jacob's stolen their inheritance. It's only a matter of time before violent breaks, violence breaks out and Jacob's on the receiving end. Now, Jacob's response is conditioned by his past experience. He follows his old patterns. When his brother Esau turned against him, Jacob ran from him in fear. Now that he faces a similar threat from Laban and his sons, he does the same thing. And by sneaking away, it makes him seem like he's a criminal. But this time, God won't let Jacob leave like a runaway slave. We know that because God has appeared to Laban. In, in verse 29, Laban says, It is in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Obviously, if God could stop Laban from threatening Jacob, he could just as easily have stopped Laban from chasing him. He could have made him turn around and let Jacob keep on running. But God won't let him do that. He wants Jacob to see the foolishness of continuing to live like a slave. Jacob is free. All his possessions are a result of God's blessing. He didn't steal anything. So this time, he doesn't need to sneak away like he's done something wrong. Without this confrontation, Jacob would always be looking over his shoulder, always carrying a load of shame, always running from his problems. Jacob is a child of God now and an heir of God's blessings, and he needs to be taught to act like one. Now, Moses told this story to the Israelites because they faced the same problem. They had known over 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And like those great group two German shepherds, it would be easy for them to continue their old patterns. It'd be easy for them to feel helpless to change their circumstances, helpless to stand up for themselves, and helpless to expect anything different. In order to enter the promised land, they'd have to learn to start acting like a chosen nation, not a band of runaway slaves. Now, do you ever find yourself thinking like a fugitive? Do you tend to run away from situations and shame that you have every right to walk away with confidence? Do people's words and accusations hold more power over you than they should? Does shame cause you to hide in the shadows when God calls you to stand in the light? I remember when I was, first became a Christian, it was easy for me to continue relating to God in my life the way I did before I knew Jesus' forgiveness. I kept thinking that disapproval was around the next corner. I kept thinking that I was about to get into trouble <laughs> instead of remembering that God loved me. Jesus had forgiven me. I carried fear and shame that had no place in a believer's life. Just as God did through this confrontation with Laban, God slowly helped me to see how he had freed me. I no longer needed to live like a slave. Now, after God helped Jacob to see how he had freed him, he then helped him to see how he had changed him. And he did that through an accusation. Watch the exchange between Laban and Jacob in verses 30 to 32. And now you've gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. Anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now, Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. And this accusation provides an opportunity for Jacob. It's an opportunity for him to do some self-examination. He's fleeing like a criminal, but when Laban confronts him, the only charge that he can bring is stealing his idols. And Jacob has no idea what he's talking about. Verse 32 tells us that it was Rachel who had stolen them. But it also says, Jacob didn't know anything about it. 
Laban may worship false gods. Rachel may hedge her bets with them. But Jacob's conscience is clear in the matter. And so he can respond to Laban's accusation now with confidence. He's learned to take responsibility for sin. In verse 32, he vows that anyone found with Laban's gods shall not live. And with that, Laban begins to conduct a thorough search, turning his camp upside down, expressing mistrust and disrespect. And when Laban's done and comes up empty handed, now it's Jacob's turn to confront Laban. I'm going to read from verse 36 to 41. Again, from Genesis 31, verse 36 to 41. Then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. Jacob said to Laban, what is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? For you have felt through all my goods. What have you found of all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen that they may decide between us two. These 20 years I've been with you, your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried, and I have not eaten the rams of your flocks. What was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. For my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. There I was. By day the heat consumed me, and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years I have been in your house, I served you. Fourteen years for your two daughters and six years for your flock. And you've changed my wages ten times. Now, this is important history for Jacob to review. Without this confrontation, Jacob might have gone on seeing himself as the criminal fugitive. He's used to carrying around the shame of his reputation as a cheater, a deceiver. That's... That's his name after all. And those sins had defined his early years. But a false accusation forces Jacob to see just how much God has changed him. In verse 38, he can speak of his integrity in dealing with Laban's flocks. In verse 39, he mentions that he bore the losses that he suffered himself. And we realize along with Jacob himself, that he's learned responsibility even honesty. In verse 40, he says, by day the heat consumed me and the cold by night and my sleep fled from my eyes. And what he's doing is recounting the hardships he's endured in serving Laban, serving him faithfully. And we begin to realize Jacob has learned diligence through this time. Then in verse 41, he recounts how he served Laban, 14 years in order to marry his two daughters and another six years to earn the wages of his flocks. And then he adds, and you've changed my wages 10 times. It makes us realize Jacob has learned patience as he's endured all of Laban's injustice. We're not used to using words like responsibility, diligence, and patience to talk of Jacob. And I'm convinced that Jacob is just as surprised to recognize how much he's changed. And it's important that he sees this and recognizes what God has done in his life. He's not going back to the promised land as the cheater. He's returning as a changed man. He can hold his head high because he has a track record of responsibility and integrity and diligence and patience. But maybe you want to stop me at this point. Maybe you're thinking, Paul, didn't you see how he ran away? <laughs> yeah, I get it. And maybe you're thinking, haven't you read how he's overcome with fear and selfishness in chapter 32? That's true as well. Jacob isn't all that he will be, but he's not what he was. And the reality is that the same is true for you and me. If you're not just tuning in out of tradition or curiosity, if you've truly put your faith in Jesus Christ alone as your Lord and Savior, then God is slowly transforming you. He's shaping your character and refining your faith. As we push to take stock and examine our lives, we can see significant and profound ways that he's changing us. 
But unfortunately, at the same time, we're also growing in our knowledge of his will. We see more and more areas where we fall short of his standard. And if we're not careful, we can feel overwhelmed and defeated. I remember in university feeling like such a failure that I couldn't set aside regular time to read the Bible. And even now, it's easy for me to fixate on other ways that I fall short. And God was, does want me to continue to grow, but God wants us to see how he's changed us also, because that gives us confidence that he can tackle other issues in our lives as well. Jacob's plan, flee from Laban like a runaway slave. He would have ended a major chapter in his life feeling a cloud of shame and disgrace. But God intervened to bring about a different ending. He helped him to see how he had freed him and how he had changed him. His time with Laban had disciplined him and shaped him in ways that were good and significant. But finally, God helped Jacob to see how much he cared for him. We already saw the beginning of this in verse 29, where Laban tells Jacob, it is in my power to do you harm, but the God your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Those words must have given so much assurance to Jacob. He was more of a do-it-yourself type. He always seemed to act as if he was all alone, and it was all up to him. But here, when faced with a threat from Laban and his men, he can see that God's hand of protection has been upon him. God is helping him to see how much he cares for him. Then in verse 42, he says, If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands, and rebuked you last night. It's a recognition that if Laban had his way, he would have ripped him off and left him penniless. But God had been with him. God is blessed and provided for him, and Jacob can see it. And when he says later in that verse, God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night, we realize God has helped that independent Jacob to see that he's not alone. God has seen every injustice and the pain that it's caused him. God's seen how hard he's worked and the efforts that he's made. And God has come to his aid. Jacob can see how much God has cared for him. And it's a realization that all of us have to come to. If you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, don't ever think that you're on your own and trying to live this life. Because I think it's easy to think that we do what's right to please God. So if we're struggling to do something, we assume God's disapproval. We feel like we have to fight our way back into a place of acceptance. But what we learn from Jacob is that God is at work in our lives to change us. It's not us versus him. He's on our side. He's in our corner. And he wants us to see how much he cares for us. Now, this chapter ends with Laban asking Jacob for a peace treaty, and I love that. It's the first time that Laban's treated him as an equal rather than as a servant, and it's a defining moment for Jacob. He would have closed this chapter of his life as a runaway, but God has intervened, and so Jacob will leave as someone who is respected and even feared because God is with him. He'll need that confidence because in the very next chapter, he'll face the man that he fears the most. His brother Esau is coming at him with 400 men. And it's a reminder to us, we need to learn all we can as one chapter of our life comes to a close. Because inevitably, another chapter is coming and the stakes may very well be higher. Now, Moses preached this story to the Israelites because they had left slavery in Egypt and it was easy to continue to think like slaves. They needed to see that because of God's deliverance, they really were free now. They needed to hear this story because they'd seen their parents' generation die in the wilderness through disobedience. But they weren't their parents' generation, and God had changed them through their desert wanderings. 
They didn't need to make the same mistakes as they entered the promised land. And they needed to hear this story to be reminded of how much God cared for them. They hadn't made it this far alone. And as they moved forward, God would be at their side every step of the way. Now, that's why the Israelites needed to hear this story. Why do you need to? Probably the starting point is to ask whether God has truly set you free. Maybe you act like a runaway slave because you've never come to the faith in the one who can set you free. John 8.36 says that if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Through faith in Christ, we become heirs of God's precious promises. But even if you've been set free, learning to think and act like a child of God is a process. It, it, it takes, takes time. It takes being intentional about it. That's why Paul says in Galatians 5.1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. We have to stand in our freedom. Stand in our freedom in Christ and resist attempts to deny it. Similarly, in 8.15, uh, Rom Romans chapter 8.15, it says, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Step out from under that cloud of shame. Leave behind that sense of fear that you're always about to get in trouble. Know the security of your relationship with God. We can look to him as a little child grips the hands of their father. And we can know that because he's freed us. He's at work to change us and he'll never leave our side. Matt Hurd tells the story of some other people who struggled to come to terms with their freedom. It was January 28th, 1945, and World War II was coming to a close. At a Japanese prisoner of war camp near Kabanatuan in the Philippines, 121 elite army rangers broke in and liberated over 500 captive soldiers. Many of them were survivors of the infamous Bataan Death March, and they were in terrible condition, both physically and mentally. Strangely, the prisoners were so defeated and diseased and discouraged by deceit that they needed to be convinced that they were actually free. Was it another trick? A trap? Was it real? In addition to everything else, one pr prisoner named Bert Bank had become blind due to a vitamin deficiency. So he couldn't actually see his rescuers. And he refused to budge. He wasn't going to go anywhere. He didn't trust anyone. And finally, a soldier walked up to him, tugged his arm, and said, What's wrong with you? Don't you want to be free? Bank, being from Alabama, recognized the southern accent of the, the ranger and lit up with this big smile and began his journey to freedom. If you've recognized the voice of God in his word today, know that it's a voice you can trust. Follow him in the path of freedom. Walk into the fullness of your inheritance as a child of promise. Let's look to him now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're not alone. We thank you that you don't leave us, that you don't forsake us. We thank you that you're in our corner as we seek to change. And by grace, you have changed us. You have developed and matured and changed areas of our lives that we know that we couldn't have changed by ourselves. So help us to live in freedom, the freedom of heirs of promise children of God. And Father, if anyone has not become a child of God, who has not become an heir of your great promises, because they've never fully put their full weight of trust in Jesus Christ, 
draw them to yourself. Show them the deep love of Christ that was shown at the cross. The righteous one who died for sinners, that we might be set free. We praise you, Father, for your great love. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, it was an unexpected delay that showed Jacob how God had freed him, changed him, and cared for him. And I hope his story gives hope to some of the interruptions that you face in your life. If you have questions or you need prayer, send me an email or leave a comment below. And if there's someone you know who would be encouraged by Jacob's story, share it with them. And as always, for more messages of hope, visit www.gracebc.ca. God bless and see you next time.